All right, welcome to Talk Jiu-Jitsu with hosts Ugi Mike, Joey Bereski, and me, Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu. Today we have a great episode for you guys. We're going to talk about, um, oh, well, Mike made a, a post on Reddit asking about what are some things that aren't very uh, widely talked about on podcasts, and we're going to talk about some of those subjects. So um, we'll get started. The first one's pretty interesting. It's, um, let me get to it. Uh, Who's the username there? Uh, I can't read it from here. The but, great Kimura Holio. Yeah, he's saying what animals? What animals could you defeat in a fight? How how we don't actually train? Uh, sub. Okay, yeah, but we'll start with that. What animals could you defeat in a fight? And um, I'll go first. Like I'm pretty delusional, so <laughs> yeah, I just think I can defeat any any animal. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a hippo. You know, like, <laughs> let's go. So, but I know that's like pretty unrealistic. Um, it's like a chimp. Let's say a chimp. Yeah, like the ones you see people, you know, take home to get their face ripped off by. I could take a chimp, no problem. Because they they go for in, instinctively, they go for what we want the most. They go for your balls, they go for your fingers, your face, your eyes, your toes. Yeah, but they have they have balls and eyes and toes <laughs> that we can attack too, right? So I, I don't know my my mindset is always like I can do it. You know, I'll figure it out at the time, and I don't know if that's a you know something that can get me into trouble. Like obviously, wouldn't want to fight a chimp, but. Um, I would love to wrestle a bear like uh, if Khabib has done. I would love that opportunity. But um, yeah, like a lion, something like that. I think that might be difficult. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to, you know, uh, test my chances against it. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm just not going to let it kill me. You know, I'm not going to just uh, sit there and let it kill me. I'm going to, you know, do what I have to do. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, Joey, do you think um, you could take uh, like a chimp or what do you think you could take? No, man, chimps are really strong. Like uh, most primates are like stupid strong for their size. Uh, I, I've said this to a lot of people in my gym and they really disagree with me, but I think the biggest animal I could beat in a fight, and here's a caveat, I get to start on its back, is a giraffe. It's all neck, man. <laughs> I could choke that fucker. Like it's just a neck. Could you guillotine it, do you think? I don't know, or like- maybe. If it bends down to get you, you get a good wrap on that neck. I think I could take a giraffe. I don't ever want to try or find out. But I'm gonna die on this delusional hill. That there I is a story from around. a UFC fighter. I can't remember his name. He's one of the only ones to ever get a twister in in a fight. Um, he's from down south somewhere, and he choked a um, deer to death. Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell yeah. choked a deer to death. So he says, "Yeah, I don't think that would be that hard." Yeah, I think that's not. I don't know. I don't think it's that impressive to be honest. Like it's just a deer. Did he shoot it first? Did he just hop on it? No, it just jumped on it. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, they're pretty low risk. Like, how can they really hurt you that much? They can stomp yeah. on you a little bit, uh, bite you. But, um, you know, I think a giraffe is interesting because because they might have really strong neck muscles. So it might be hard to actually get to the carotid. That, that, that's one. But I feel like you could like, I feel like you could like triangle around it, oh, yeah. you know, like a body triangle <laughs> on its neck. Like, I'm pretty sure I have enough squeeze that I could what find What about a, a bear, like a small bear? Do you think oh. you can take a bear? Like a small black bear. I, I don't think I could go. Joey? A black bear? Uh, probably not. Probably not a black bear, but you give me something like a panda, maybe. I think oh, I can I fuck know, up a panda. Man. They seem pretty dumb. Yeah, give me any animal. Let's go. I think, I think the biggest I could do would be a medium-sized dog if I was angry enough. And, and even then, you know, they could go right for your throat and rip it out. Yeah, well, one good move against uh, dogs is just to stick your finger in their butt because, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the way to let uh, make them let go of a choke. Um, yeah, stick their finger in their butt. And but if, this, if it didn't work, how dumb would you feel? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like okay, that didn't work. Now uh, I look like an idiot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's yeah. I think people. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a pretty interesting subject for sure. Like I wouldn't want to test it out, but uh, I wouldn't like I would not believe in myself. I'd be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna survive. I'm gonna I'm gonna get this thing no matter what it is. But yeah, that could be delusion. It's kind of similar to, um, you know, I'm doing the self-defense challenge in Australia and we're doing like knife defense. Like people are going to try to attack me with not fake knives and they're going to try to, they're going to be like two on ones and stuff like that. And like my mentality is like, I'm not going to get stabbed even once. I'm going to like, I'm going to fight those two dudes, no problem. And just like win. But like, is that actually going to happen? I guess we're, we're going to see in a couple of weeks, but like, Probably I should have prepared more. <laughs> and that was like my plan to like get people to try to tap me with knives and get the like um, accustomed to that. But at the same time, it's like uh, I, I trust my I trust my ability and um, we'll see what happens there. And we'll, we'll see what happens happens for an animal, too. I saw how jacked uh, kangaroos are. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Like I saw the other day, there's a 
a video, this guy, this uh, kangaroo is trying to drown this guy's dog. And uh, he just like shouted at it and, and he like uh, splashed him with water. And then the kangaroo just, you know, fucked off. Like he, uh, he was scared. I think that's one thing too. You have to scare animals to not want to fight you. Um, well, that is definitely a thing. And, uh, but yeah, kangaroos are jacked and I would like to, you know, a tussle with a kangaroo. Maybe I will in, in Australia. So I'm going to be there for two weeks. I'll find a kangaroo. I'll film it. Um, as long as I don't get in trouble for like animal cruelty or something like that. I was going to say, you might have to circumvent some laws or uh, go to another country or state to, uh, to try some of these things. Yeah. Can you, you imagine I get banned from Australia because I, uh, <laughs> I fought a, a kangaroo, but, um, yeah, I guess there's nowhere else to really do that. So yeah, might as well while I'm there. I think so. the laws are loose in Dagestan for fighting bears. So yeah. Yeah. And we have bears here, but not very many. Um, but like the black bears are always scared. Like, like I've, I haven't seen one personally, but like my sister saw one, um, it came like right up to her and, uh, yeah, it just like, I don't know. Black bears are like the least scary bear. Um, other than like, uh, a panda, I guess that's considered a bear. Well, I used to hunt in Alberta and we went bear hunting and I was scared shitless, even though I had a very large rifle with me, because if I fuck up once and that thing comes at me, I'm done. You know, I can't get off another shot while it's a foot away from me. Yeah. I'm yeah. I, can you imagine a polar bear? Fuck that. No, I cannot imagine. They're the scariest of all the bears to me. I would take it. No problem. <laughs> I'm telling you, I would take it. Okay. So this, this is what someone said too. What to do if a head coach is bad. And I've, you know, I've rolled with a lot of people over my years and I've rolled with some pretty poor um, head coaches and more than often than not, their students are also very bad. Um, and that's just reality. And so what, do, what to do with a head coach? I think you're, Oh, that's not very good. I think the only real option is to train somewhere else. Like they don't need, they, if like they're older or whatever, we talked about this before th that can definitely um, impact like, you know, their performance on the mats, but like at the same time, it's their technicality. Uh, that, that's what's important. And some, some head coaches have very poor um, technicality. And one reason is because like back in the day, it was much harder to find good jujitsu content to consume and uh, get instruction from reputable people. And um, it's hard to break bad habits. So like if someone's getting away with like really poor technique for years, but they're, you know, they're still beating white belts and like other people, then like, they're not going to, uh, yeah, that's, they're not going to improve. Like you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like that's how I always sound because like, yes, like I've rolled up so many people like, um, where, or so, yeah, like if someone comes to the gym and they train somewhere else that had a poor head coach, it's very hard for them to get, uh, to break those habits. So yeah, I guess the only real thing to, to do is to, um, to train somewhere else or really supplement your training, which you should do anyways, even if you have a great head coach uh, to learn stuff online. But uh, yeah, what do you think, Joey? Uh, I think there's a couple factors that really depend. Like it depends. What are your goals? Like if your head coach is like a good guy, he's just not particularly amazing at jujitsu, but you're not trying to be a competitor. You're just there to like burn a couple calories and have some friends like sure. Like it's not the end of the world. Uh, if you really want to get good and your head coach sucks, Unless, like you said, there's like mitigating factors like, you know, he's old, he's got a lot of injuries, you know, st like people have issues like that where maybe they can't be as like physically imposing when they roll, but there's a lot of knowledge in the brain. Uh, but if he doesn't have that, then I would say like, if you really want to get good, you probably have to find a better coach. Um, for the most part, people will tend to be like when it comes to learning jujitsu, like slightly a product of the environment. Like if you train in a good room with good guys, you're going to get good information, uh, good responses, good training partners, good coaching, you'll get good. Like it's, it's very hard to train in a very good gym and not get at least kind of good. Um, so yeah, but uh, the question, I don't think they said good or bad at jujitsu. When they say bad head coach, if your head coach is like a bad person, like an asshole, just leave. Yeah. yeah. And then when you leave, they're going to give you a hard time. That's for sure. But like, that's just, just something you need to accept and uh, deal with because yeah, if they're, if they're a crappy head coach, like they're not very nice. They're, they're <laughs> definitely not going to be nice when you, when you, when you quit. And uh, yeah, I've experienced that firsthand, uh, but not to get into that too much, but uh, yeah, the, it, yeah, it's annoying, but yeah, that brings us into another question, uh, another response someone had, which was like, <clears throat> Uh, coaches not quite getting the respect that they deserve because other disciplines like boxing and uh, wrestling, wrestling yeah. yeah, you kind of like uh, 
like the head coach, even if they're not like, you know, the, when you wrestle with them, you still kick their ass. It's like you, it's fine. Like you still, it's not a big deal because you just accept that they're older. But at the same time, those sorts are much more um, physical, I would say. So like jiu-jitsu, you can get by with less athleticism. So even if you're older, um, if your technicality is great, it can be fine where it's like wrestling. If you have great technicality, but like you can't quite perform physically, uh, that's going to be very hard to be effective. So I think that's another um, thing to consider as well, for sure. But I don't know. I don't really see too many coaches like getting disrespect um, in the sense. I don't know. Maybe they are because it, it kind of is the expectation that the coach should be the best guy in the gym. So I don't know. I guess that is true. So, uh, yeah. What do you think, Joey? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely this like stigma in jujitsu that like, you know, maybe some coaches definitely don't get the respect they deserve, um, especially when it comes to competing in competition. Like, uh, I think there's a lot of coaches, like if you look at boxing or other martial arts like that, that have been around a long time and there's been a lot of development in the sport. Like if you talk to like an old school boxing coach, the amount of knowledge they have is insane. And the way they work with their athletes and corner them, give them advice during a fight is fantastic. Most of them are very, very good at it. So they get a lot of credit for it. Um, but if you go to a jujitsu tournament, man, the amount of times you'll just hear coaches like talking through a technique, be like, grab his left wrist, pummel, stand up. And you're like, this isn't even helpful advice. You're just yelling nonsense at an athlete. Like, the level of coaching isn't up to par with these other sports. And part of that is because jujitsu is so new as a sport where you're just getting guys who are like, like we talked about earlier, kind of like, Oh, I started a long time ago. I'm kind of good at this. I got a black belt and now I'm teaching, but they have no idea how to coach. They might know how to teach a technique, but they don't know how to coach. And that's the big thing you'll see um, with a lot of like boxing gyms or even now some MMA gyms are switching into that where you're getting guys who are, coaching boxers or coaching MMA fighters who've never fought themselves. Uh, they're just really intelligent people. They understand the game, but what they really understand is how to coach someone when they need to be coached. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And uh, just to kind of branch off that, I think it, it's like, I, it's always very interesting <clears throat> when, when I'm at a tournament and listening to the other coaches, like what they're saying to their athletes. And most of the time it's pretty good like overall, but sometimes it can be like pretty poor advice or at the same time, sometimes they're just they're just coaching the whole time and it's just like so much like information being put to the to the athlete that they can't quite comprehend it so what i think is the best way to coach someone is like uh like less is more so like coach them like you know yell instruction so they can hear it um when it's necessary but like not all the time <laughs> because like if the person's like going for a triangle for example and you're going you're yelling like go for the triangle the triangle it's like well you're just you're just telling the person like the other person what, what the person's going to try to do and uh that, that actually happened to nikki on the weekend um or last weekend she was going you know attacking the kimura and i don't know who it was but they were saying like you know go for the kimura to attack the arm or whatever and nikki's like she said after she they wish that they didn't do that because that was already her plan and then it's like giving it away so and nikki said too like um that she appreciated the way i coached um her for that uh match because i was only giving her instruction when it was important like other than that i trust nikki's judgment to do what she needs to do so like there was one moment she could have went for uchimata i could see that she wanted to go for it i told her like no like don't like don't do that like don't risk that because it can be a risky takedown when you do it with with an over with an overhook um you might get your back taken um because they have they have the underhook and you know uchi mod can be great for sure but like um yeah i just don't i didn't think it was worth the risk in that moment and then she didn't go for it and uh but then at the same time i wasn't like just yelling the whole time you know do this do that do that it's like well she, she can she can figure it out herself for, for a lot of it but then like um lower belts that can't quite figure it out either you still need to give them some space to work like you can't just give them instruction the whole time because the, the important stuff is going to get uh lost in the mix so uh, yeah i think that uh it's not just about being like a good coach like um of like what you're saying it's also how much you're saying so like joey when you go to coach people like um do you have that same kind of approach where not the whole time you need to be given instruction like you need to let it breathe a little bit i think yeah, I mean, like uh, one of my students and I went to a tournament this weekend and 
I think one of his matches was like three minutes before he subbed the guy. I might have said two sentences in the entire match because, you know, he's just doing the right thing. Like, you know, he pulled guard, he's playing guard, he's setting it up. And I'm like, man, if I'm going to try and have to yell, like, you know, push the arm through to get a triangle, if I have to coach you through how to do a technique, I didn't do my job in the gym when I should have been teaching you how to recognize where to pick, like get these submissions. And if you don't know to do it, me talking you through it in real time when you're stressed, stressed against a resisting opponent is not going to teach you how to do this technique. What it's probably going to do is make you try something you didn't really want to do and fuck it up. And then you're going to get punished. Uh, a lot of my coaching is just reminding people like, you know, if you're in someone's closed guard, I'll be like, hey, he's going to open his guard to try and attack. That's when we posture. Like, that's when we go. Like, he's going to do this. Be ready for that signal. Or like, you know, one of my guys is in half guard and the guy keeps trying to come up on his side. And I'm like, hey, just keep him flat and then work to pass. Like, don't let him come up on his side. It's just like tactical things you should be giving people as a coach, not so much technical things. And I think that's a distinction that a lot of coaches aren't good at making. Like, I'm not talking you through how to do a technique. I'm talking you through what you should be trying to approach with the match. Plus, as a lower belt, when you're doing your first few tournaments, you're so overwhelmed by the stimulus. It's, it's just everything is so overwhelming. You can't take everything in. I could barely hear Jordan my first tournament. I could barely hear Jake t uh, telling me what to do. So just little, short, concise, you know, commands were, were very helpful. Yeah, it's also helpful helpful for the coach as well because like my voice by the by the end of the day is just destroyed. Like I like my throat hurts everything. I can't even like talk after. It's just it's awful. So like now that I've been kind of taking a more like uh, um yeah room, more room to breathe approach, it's like saving my voice and uh, it's making me much louder for the people that um, for everyone because by the end of the day you're trying to coach someone. And it's like I can't get like loud at all because i'm like destroying my voice right now so yeah i think like basic instruction and like objective is is, is much more important than like do this do this like very like micromanaging your athlete which is something i think i used to do um like back in the day i used to my coaching approach was much more micromanaging and i don't think that was a good approach at all but like uh just over time you learn how to do things better and uh yeah micromanaging is not the way to do it that's for sure and um yeah, but uh, like tournaments, um, yeah, like one thing that was interesting um, at the tournament was like the incon inconsistency in the refs because some would uh, allow head and arm throws for kids, which is illegal, and uh, other ones would stop it, and which which is the right thing to do. Because one of my kids, they got taken down with a head and arm throw. It's like a hip throw, but instead of having an underhook, you have their head. And uh, the kid got two points. I'm like... Uh, you know, I'm trying, I don't want to give anyone a hard time, but I'm like, ref, like that was an illegal throw. And then, yeah, I asked him after and he's, yeah, I don't know if I went over this last, last podcast, but uh, yeah, he's like, yeah, uh, yeah, it was like, I, I messed up. Okay. You know, like, you know, fair game, good to go. But like, we need more consistency in the refing because I also, I posted a match on YouTube, um, which was like, I framed it like, did the ref screw me? Because I figured that would be a good way to uh, entice people to watch. But uh, like the scoring itself was confusing for me. And a lot of people uh, clarified it, which I which I appreciate. So I can learn the points better. But um, yeah, I think that's also an issue too. With like, people don't really understand the, the like the rules. Like, I'll be the first one to admit, I don't understand the rules uh, nearly as well as I should. Consider, considering I've been training 12 years and competing for a large majority of it. Um, yeah, I don't even know the rules great. So it's like, there's so many, um, like, I don't know, subjective, not maybe not subjective, but it, things can be a little bit murky at times and uh, it can be very confusing for people. So like coaches like trying to influence uh, the rest decision and stuff like that, which is uh, something you should do, but like they might not even know the rules themselves. So um, yeah, I think coaches and myself included, should take like a ref course just uh, to learn the rules better and uh, better help their athletes and not, um, you know, argue with refs over something that they're right about. I think they're getting better on like reaping and stuff like that because I was talking to a guy who competed on the weekend and he said that he was called for reaping. They didn't disqualify him, but the guy grabbed his leg and pulled it over to reap. So uh, before that would have been instant DQ, would it not? Like back in the day? 
Yeah, back in the day. And one of our um, students, um, he reaps, he reaps someone really bad and they, he didn't get disqualified. Like he, they didn't even say anything. And like, I was thinking like, um, he's probably gonna get disqualified here. Like I'm like yelling, like, don't turn to your left. Like don't turn inward because that's going to be a reap. And then that's the way he was turning. And uh, yeah, nothing, just like no big deal. But then back in the day and probably now too, depending on the ref, like if you reap someone, they're going to give you like an instant um, DQ, even if it's like their knee was fine. So yeah, the inc inconsistency uh, can be really frustrating, but I guess it depends on the tournament too. Um, because some, some organizations are very like strict with their refs, making sure they have like the best refs. And then some are just like, you know, can anyone ref? Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a tough one. Joey is a ref. Like, um, do you, uh, yeah. Do you see like a lot of poor calls and stuff like that while you're coaching and that kind of frustrate you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really frustrating, uh, as a ref and like, just to throw it back to your video. Um, the one thing I thought was interesting. So like I watched it, um, I actually thought the ref did a pretty decent job. There were a couple things I think he could have made a little more clear but overall i think the score was correct but what really shocked me was the comments uh how many people were commenting what they thought the score was or how the refing should have been with uh a lot of confidence let's say and uh a lot of their explanations for why the score was the way it was or why it should have been something else were uh pretty incorrect and that just goes to show like you know, people are really confident about their interpretation of the rules. And maybe they've even read the rule book or done a rule seminar or something. And a lot of those people don't really understand it. Or, you know, it's easy when you do these rules courses, I've done three or four of them now, uh, to hear the rules and go, okay, I understand that. But then when you're seeing it in real time in a chaotic scramble, it can be really hard now to, okay, hold on, which rules am I applying? Like, I know in your video, there was one where I think he was on the bottom, rolled you over, and then you rolled him right back, uh, basically, but you rolled out of bounds and you ended up on top side control. So like, uh, there were a lot of people saying, oh, it should have been two for a sweep for both of you. It has to stabilize with him on top, but because it hit the edge of the mat, so the IBJJF uses the yellow edge of the mats as a warning space, anything that occurs outside of those mats basically is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You're going to start standing. If it wasn't a settled position when you landed, it starts standing. So there are like some people commenting interpretations of that. And I'm like, you know, there are also areas in the rule book that are refs interpretations of things, you know, like uh, when it says it has to be a stabilized position. Well, I mean, you and I've been grappling long enough that you can look at something and go, you know, maybe it doesn't look picture perfect, but like it's stable. Like that's a, a position, you know, they're in it. Uh, or there could be a position where it looks stable and you're like, no, the guy on the bottom is fighting. Like this isn't controlled yet at all. So there is room for ref interpretation. Um, yeah, like it, it kills me when I'm coaching, man, because like I'll see a ref do something wrong and you're like, I can yell, I can do what I want, like to try and get this changed. But like, I really have no bearing on the outcome, especially if it's a bad ref. Um, like we had one this weekend, my guy was against a guy got the other guy went for straight ankle lock on my athlete. And it was like a really bad reap. Like the foot came like all the way to the opposite hip. He had the ankle lock. The ref stops it. Now this should be a DQ because he's threatening the submission, but the ref's like, Hey man, it's white belt. I'm going to explain like you can't bring that foot across like it can't come across can't do that and the guy is of course like i wasn't trying to heel hook him and the ref's like yeah it's not really like i'm not yeah whatever like you can't do this motion though so the ref moves the foot off of the reap and then it's like can i restart it restarts it and the kid immediately puts the foot back across into the reap so the ref dqs him and i'm like as a coach i could have gotten angry that he didn't dq him the first time but at the same time like it's white belt, like give, give them a chance, you know, like some people don't know the rules and that's a really good opportunity to teach that kid the rule. And then somehow still manage to immediately break the rule again, two seconds later after being explained what it was. But like, that's a good opportunity for that guy to go back to his coach and be like, Hey, I need you to explain this rule because I'm not getting it. Like, I don't understand, but yeah, like it's, it's hard, man. It's hard when the level of refing is low as a ref and you coach and it's just, 
unacceptably yeah, exactly. bad. Exactly. And in that in that match I posted, um, like Eric is a great ref, and I, I really didn't want it, it to sound like I was throwing any shade at him because I think he is great. Um, but like, yeah, like that that was really interesting seeing the comments because some people were like, you know, you should get three points uh, because you passed the guard uh, because I ended up in side control, but. I I appreciate those comments saying that you know I won the match, but at the same time it was it was like um, just interesting to see people like you said with so much confidence, like giving their interpretation of what they're and what they're saying is what they're saying is right. Um, but there's only one uh, true uh, like truth, which is yeah I lost <laughs> six four, but not not a huge deal. But um, when it comes to the ankle pick that I got, well I didn't really get it because I didn't get points, but like. Like he got points, but I think the reason was it was more like real, I guess. Like uh, he, I think he got my ankle kind of as I was dropping, like I was dropping down to kind of prevent that. But then he was already dropping down when I did mine to get the ankle um, pick or whatever. But like for for that one, Joey, um, like what what like what happened there? Like like why didn't I get points? Not that I think I deserve them, but like just to clarify, um, so I understand it better too. So that's like in that match, the most contestable thing I think you could see. So uh, in the IBJJF rule book, and I'm assuming this is in Ontario, so it usually goes by IBJJF, um, the intent and who initiates really matters. So uh, when he got his ankle pick on you, he started whatever motion he was going to do uh, before you started to sit. In his, uh, what I'm assuming, I can't obviously speak for Eric or definitely can't speak for what Eric saw in real time, but it looks like he starts to sit and then you start the motion for the ankle pick. Uh, you would have to start first. So a really common misconception is that like, oh, if I have your leg and you sit, it's a takedown. Technically in the IBJJF rule book, if I'm even trying to grab your leg when you sit, it can be a takedown. Uh, because you sat to counter my emotion of shooting. So like if I shoot and you sit before I even get my grip on you, I'll still get my two takedown points. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Um, also, like uh, Eric couldn't really see the angle. Um, he's like behind me. So when I touched his leg, um, he didn't really see it. And I, I remember like talking to him, he like, shouldn't I get points for that? And then I'm pretty sure he told me if I talk to him, I'll, I'll get disqualified. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I won't argue this anymore. But uh, yeah, I, it, I think that it was that match, but I know it could be a different one. I, I, Cause I just remember once like contesting something with a rep during the match and being told that I'll be DQ'd if I, if I argued, um, which makes sense. But is that a rule too? You, you can't talk to the ref while you're competing. Yeah, you uh, you can't communicate with them in any way. That's uh, your coach's job to yell, at least in IBJJF. That's one thing I'll say um, I really like. It's a different rule set, obviously, but ADCC, you're allowed to communicate with the ref during the match. So if something happens, you can look at the ref, like, you know, look up at him and be like, hey, should I get three points for this? Like, did I, why didn't I get three points? And he'll, they'll actually respond back to you in the match. Like, they'll they'll try and communicate the rules. And that's, something I think the IBJJF needs to change. Like as an athlete, you know, you said like, Hey, should I not get takedown points there? Instead of just saying like, if you talk to me again, I disqualify you. The ref should be like no points. Like it wasn't a takedown. You didn't have the ankle before he initiated the sitting motion. That's all you have to say. And now you as the athlete can go, okay, I understand what happened. I'm not going to be, you know, but to just like, I hate that rule of like, you can't communicate with the ref. And I understand that it's in there to try and stop athletes from losing their shit on reps which it doesn't work uh you see it all the time but at least this way if there is a dispute you would be able to talk about it in real time as opposed to after the match now having to go hey when i did that why wasn't it points and now it's like four minutes ago it's out of everyone's mind like i would rather have that conversation in real time yeah exactly because i was you know confused but i was still happy because um i thought like realistically like i if like if it was a role in the gym it was like a very close role so like yeah losing to uh by two points to one of the best in canada wasn't a huge deal to me i only i had only been training five years at that point and it was only um like a not even a year and a half removed from when i was a blue belt so i felt like um okay whatever this is like actually uh good you know it just shows that you know, I can, I can hang with these guys and, uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Good experience. So that was the open weight division. 
yeah, yeah the open yeah. weight division and i just beat a black belt like 23 nothing um who was much bigger than me and that whole thing shocked me too because i you know i have confidence going in but i'm like shit i gotta i gotta compete against against this huge dude and then it actually shocked me how dominant i was because i don't know i think he just wanted to leg lock me um and i wasn't giving him that and yeah it was just it blew my mind like 23 nothing like let's go what's going on here? Like I just got my brown belt and I beat a black belt. So, and, and that guy, uh, that I beat, like he, um, he, he had broken Jonathan Sateva's, um, ankle, I think his ankle or maybe his knee and Jonathan Sateva's, uh, he, he Marcel Garcia black belt and he was like doing very well in competition. So I'm like, shit, I got to go against this guy who just beat this like really well-known guy and like broke his ankle. And, uh, yeah. And then I just like dominate. I don't, yeah. It, it was a strange thing because like, I'm not saying this to boast. It's like reality. It was just, it was just surprising how easy it was. I don't mean that disrespectfully. Um, but yeah, that was like, that gave me a lot of confidence. It was, uh, you know, it was fun for sure. Well, I thought the coolest thing about that video was, uh, like the whole rules thing aside, watching that and then watching you now, like the difference in your game and the way you approach things is like, I don't know. I thought it was really cool. Maybe because I've been rolling with you for so long. Uh, like, you know, when we roll in the gym, obviously I know how good you are now, but we've been rolling together for what, like 10 years, 12 years. Uh, it's like a gradual, like I improve as you improve and we kind of just feel it the whole way, but seeing that old footage and then knowing what I know now and seeing the new footage and having rolled with you recently, like, uh, it just really shows like, okay, like you can make some dramatic improvements in a relatively short period of time. If you approach things the right way, which clearly you have. Yeah. And thank you. And 100% because like, I, I was like making that video thinking like, this is how well I did a brown and black belt division after five years of training only. And I'm like, well, shit, I've been training 12 years now. So like, um, yeah, I, I would like to, it is like motivating to go compete again. Um, but that time will come for sure because everyone I competed against in the past, like, uh, they're all doing very well. Like we came up like me and Joey around the time where like, everyone was just so good and uh if which forced us to be uh really good like all the people that we competed against are all the ones that are like top black belts now like killing it uh some in like adcc some in um you know like uh, ibjjf tournaments just doing great and uh yeah it's like more like the teaching approach and uh but i'll get back in there one day for sure i was gonna say did that video make you want to give you the itch again yeah it did yeah. for sure but yeah. at the same time i remember I don't know. I just think about how stressful it is to yeah, compete, and uh, like being at the tournament last weekend. Um, I was thinking, like, thank God I didn't sign up to compete because I thought about it because I just wasn't. It's just so hot in there and just so stressful. And it's like I wouldn't want to compete right now. Like after just like coaching so many students and like I'm just so tired and like uh, don't have the motivation to, to like roll right now in a competition. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I'll come back soon for sure. And uh, that's one recommendation I will give to you, though, uh, as someone who's been competing a ton, if you're going to come back, don't do it at an event where you have students competing. Uh, it, man, it is so hard to coach students all day and go through like, I'm sure you're a lot like me, where like, man, it's emotionally draining. Like when you're watching your students win or lose, like it's, it's stressful, it's hard, you know, you want to be out there and be able to help them. And sometimes you're like, man, you're making just this small mistake and I want to help you so bad. And I'm watching you lose a match that I know you can win or you're watching them win and you're so excited for them and your emotions go up and down all day. And then to like have to, okay, step back, recenter, take my time and try and get in the right mindset to compete yourself is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, it's really hard. Yeah. Really difficult. And yeah, I like, it is so tough seeing students make such small mistakes because I feel like I just want to do it for them, which obviously is like impossible, but like, um, it kind of shows me too, that the fundamentals are the most important thing because we've been doing a lot of wrestling with our kids and which is very important and is fundamentals, but like they were still making like small mistakes. Like they'd be in half guard and turning their hips away from their partner, even though we went over that and they were, but even our, our adults were doing that too. And then, so yeah, it was kind of like frustrating in a sense because I know they know better, but you know, when, when everything's going on in the competition, it's hard to do everything perfect, but like, that's what we worked on after it's uh, like making sure that you to keep your hips turned towards them. If you get in quarter guard, how to get it, how to get back to your, to your, to your half guard. 
and uh, yeah, the tournaments are just so great for uh, showing you where you know your students need to improve. Um, but yeah, definitely very stressful. Like always the next day, I'm always just so tired to, from it. It just wipes me out. Um, just like yeah, like emotions can play such a big uh, part on you physically. And uh, yeah, I agree. Like when I come back, like when when I compete again, like I'll definitely do it at a tournament that I don't have many students or any students competing. And I'll probably start off with, with masters, um, which like for one reason is just because it's a six minute match instead of a 10 minute match. So it makes it easier. And, um, but then too, it's just a good like warm up because masters division can be filled with really good people, but like the adult division is really like where like the top competitors are, are at. So it's just good to have like kind of like a warm up type of tournament and do like masters first, but you know, not that I'm saying like masters is any less, um, you know, prestigious to win. Like it's still great. If someone gets first place in masters for sure. But, um, yeah, we, um, someone, uh, on that thread also mentioned, uh, what they say, they said most everyone, mostly everyone sucks and will always suck because they have no athletic ability. There's a survivorship bias because there's so much attrition and that sort, uh, that sort of helps a little bit. So I think that is true. Like just realistically, like not that everyone's going to suck always, but like, um, if you lack athletic ability, you're going to have a much harder time in jujitsu. And, um, yeah, it just, just, it just enhances your jujitsu. And some people are just naturally very unathletic and they don't put in the time to, uh, try to change that. And, uh, if they get beat up a whole bunch, um, even with perfect technique, they're always going to struggle. So, that's just reality. Like, uh, it's a physical sport and, um, yeah. But what do you think, uh, Mike, especially as like someone that's going through a lot of injuries, but yeah. like, you still like, uh, you still perform out there on the mat. So you're still very good. I, I, I find that my athleticism is, is going down the older I get and it makes things a lot harder. I have to uh, be way more technical and I can't get away with what I could before, but yeah. Um, athleticism plays a huge part, but I can see mine starting to go down a bit. I may have to, uh, up the TRT a little bit, maybe, uh, a little bit of a little bit of SIE to help me out. Yeah, maybe add in like Anavar or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, you never know. You never know what could end up in that mix. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, for sure, I agree with you 100 percent on that. Yeah, I mean, I think like uh, you know, it's it feels bad to say for a lot of people, but like a lot of athleticism is your genetics. I mean, there's certain things you can't change. Like you can't really change, uh, you know, your body's, you know what types of muscle fibers your body's inclined to grow. Like you can kind of work on it. Uh, you can't really change some natural, like just facets of your life. Like if you are a person who just has terrible reaction time, like it's going to be almost impossible to change that. Like they've shown that, you know, reaction time drills don't really do much to change reaction time. Um, you know, some people aren't fast. Some people don't move well. Some people are not naturally muscular people they're not flexible like they're things you can work on a little bit to but to an extent like you just kind of have what you have um and like i'm someone who's not athletic and as a competitor like it's a hard realization to come to that like i will never be able to win like a world championship or something not because i can't have the technique to do it but just because i don't have the body or the natural skills or the athleticism to do it. Like uh, I would just watch the East coast trials for ADCC that went on this weekend. And, you know, I'm watching these guys roll and I'm like, man, I'm so much more technical than half of these guys who are making it to like quarterfinals and semifinals. But I'm like, they're so much more athletic than I am that I don't know if realistically I would ever be able to close that gap, especially because it's easier for them to get more technical than it is for me to get more athletic. That kid that just kept going side to side passing. I don't know if it was 77 kilogram. 66. Cam Dorian 66. Oliveras. Yeah. Uh, that kid impressed the shit out of me. He was a wrestler basically. Yep. And he just kept flow passing side to side to side. And he just wore everybody out cardio. He went a hundred percent from start to finish and just wore everybody out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was really impressive to watch, but like you watch his actual jujitsu and you're like, you know, it's it's not remarkable like the the jujitsu itself is the submission grappling is not remarkable but what was remarkable was the way he took his natural attributes and applied them to a rule set in a way that favored him 
so much more than it favored his opponents. I mean, he was really manipulating the fact that if you can have your opponent be upright in the second half of the ADCC when points come in, he's going to take you down because he's an exceptional wrestler and he's just going to wear you out with that pace. I mean, he did it to multiple time black belt world champions. Yeah, I, I feel like for me, that's like the toughest uh, competitor to deal with someone that just wants to wear you out. And, uh, you know, because cardio is king and uh, like wrestlers have cardio for days. And uh, yeah, like that's it's definitely tough because even even people like they're athletic, you can have different like ways of being athletic, like uh, explosiveness obviously helps a lot. But like some people just naturally have really good cardio, too. Like they might lack a little bit of strength, um, but they make up for it in cardio. Like I've, I've competed against guys before where it's like, how the fuck do you not get tired whatsoever? Like I'm like dying after and they're like uh, not breathing heavy. And those people, yeah, those are the ones that I find I have the hardest time against because as your cardio diminishes, um, so does your technique or ability to apply your technique. And then even if they have worse technique um, because they're so fresh still, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to deal with. And um, yeah, it's like, ADCC also favors, uh, well, I wouldn't say favors wrestlers, but um, it's more complementary towards wrestlers than other jiu-jitsu rule sets. So it's pretty interesting to see him win, especially as, as a 17 year old, yeah. like he has a bright future for sure. And definitely just like so many wrestlers could um, transition to jiu-jitsu and do so well. Um, but yeah, I don't know why more don't, um, I guess, some are just busy, you know, doing what they're doing and having success with that. But I think there's a lot more money to be made in jiu-jitsu. So I would think that it's a smarter approach to, uh, as a wrestler to go towards jiu-jitsu and, and transition to that sport, unless you're doing like, uh, you know, like Olympic team or whatever it is for wrestling. But if you're like, you know, a D one wrestler, that's pretty good, but you're not winning like, um, you know, first place then maybe it's better to transition to jujitsu where you might have more success. Like um, it's the same thing with like MMA. Like, like if I go to compete in MMA against guys that have less than five fights, because that's what I would have to do to um, like, they wouldn't give me an opponent with more fights than that. I think that it's easier for me to win in MMA than it is for me to win in jujitsu. Not because I um, doubt my jujitsu skills, but because the guys I'd be competing against in jiu-jitsu are also very good at jiu-jitsu, but then like MMA, they're like the guys under five fights, at least my jiu-jitsu is going to be way better than their jiu-jitsu. And uh, it's like an easier path to win. So um, not that that influences what I want to do, because either way I want to, I will be fighting MMA uh, one day. So I, I can't not fight pro uh, and be happy with um, how my career went. Like I, I want to, I want to get that accolade. But um, yeah, it's like it, it's easier to win fights in MMA uh, than it is jujitsu for me at this at this at this moment. Um, like, but it's the same thing with wrestlers. I think it's easier for them to apply their skills to jujitsu where, where where it's easier um, because a lot of jujitsu athletes don't have great wrestling because they haven't picked up my course uh, with Joe Breeza, wrestling for jujitsu dot com or wrestling for bjj dot com. Yeah, that's not that's not why. Maybe maybe that, but that probably contributes. But um, yeah, like. It's almost at a path of least resistance for success. So I'd like to see more uh, wrestlers crossover for sure. I would love to do more wrestling, but I find the older that I get, the more injury prone I am. And uh, it's harder for me to recover from it. Like I, like we were talking earlier, I just had x-rays done of my neck and my spine. And I found out that I have facet disease in like, I don't know, six of my vertebrae. Like it's brutal. It's painful all the time. So I have to adjust my game for that. But what I am lacking in athleticism is that's going down. I, my strength has not gone down. I, I condition myself. I go to the gym every or three days a week and my strength is still good. I know they say you don't need to use a lot of strength, use technique in jujitsu, but strength sure as shit helps, right? Like, I mean, to get you out of some tough spots, sometimes you need explosivity and strength. Well, and when you're, go when you're going against guys that also have great technique, uh, strength can be the factor that helps you win. So yeah, 100% is important. And, uh, yeah, like wrestling is definitely harder on harder on the body. Like, um, 
yeah, sometimes when I shoot for a takedown and I, I'll, I'll hit my head on, uh, on them and just like jacks up my neck and I'm like, fuck, you know, maybe I shouldn't have shot. Um, like maybe I should kind of prioritize like, uh, takedowns that don't involve like upper body takedowns that don't involve my head so much because my neck is screwed up. And that's also something that, uh, mentioned in that Reddit thread you made, um, just like the, the reality of the, of the wear and tear that Jitsu has on your body, because I don't think it's like horrible. Um, and like, if you don't use your body, you're going to, uh, it's going to diminish and any sport you use your body in, um, there's going to be, um, some wear and tear on it. But like when it comes to jujitsu, like definitely your neck and spine and everything, um, take a lot of wear and tear, which are pretty important. Whereas like tennis or something like that, you know, you might like twist a knee, which is awful. Like you don't want to hurt your knees. That's for sure. But like your neck and your back should always be fine. So yeah, I think that's something that should be talked about more. It's like, uh, making sure your body is good to go during this whole process, you know, because me and Joey have been training so long, like 12, 13 years. And, uh, yeah, we've been in some bad spots, hurt, hurt our necks multiple times. Like I'd be interested to see what my, what my neck looks like, <laughs> like if I had an x-ray, um, and see if I have any like collapsed, uh, discs or anything like that. Um, yeah, maybe I should get that checked out sometime. But uh, yeah, definitely a lot of wear and tear. Um, yeah, I would definitely take the wear and tear that jujitsu has given my body over um, what I was like before—a sedentary lifestyle, uh, addicted to drugs, and sitting at home eating fucking junk food and sleeping twenty hours a day. I think I'm much. I'd rather take the risk of of getting hurt here. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I what, what, the way I feel about it. You know, I'd rather use my body and it be abused a little bit than not use my body where it is being abused by a sedentary uh lifestyle 100 yeah i mean like it uh, any sport done at a high level or done you know excessively like the way you and i train jiu-jitsu is not easy on the body like you can't play american football for 14 years and not have a pretty fucked up body like it's it's gonna happen these sports are hard on you um but, and I, I know I haven't necessarily taken like the best care of my body through the years. I'm pretty uh, nonchalant about injuries and stuff. And I've had some really bad luck too, but I use it as like an opportunity to teach my students like, Hey man, like you got to take care of yourself or you're going to end up like me. <clears throat> like, uh, you know, about a year ago, I had a, a follow-up MRI on my knee and the surgeon I talked to you know, he said to me afterwards when he saw the MRI, he's like, I'm going to be honest with you. This is the worst looking knee I have seen outside of car crash victims. He's like, wow. I'm, I'm shocked you're able to walk with this thing, let alone do sports. And like, you know, it is what it is. Like, this is just kind of something you have to know when you do a combat sport. Like these things can happen. Like, you know, if you injure yourself, yeah, you can rehabilitate and do all the work, but like, it's a combat sport. Things can go wrong in your body. You have to take care of it as best you can. You know, and everything at, has, yeah, everything has a cost. And like, sometimes the cost is going to be higher if you're unlucky. And when you're at my age, I went to a, a orthopedic surgeon to look at my knee because my knee's fucked. And uh, he goes, are you a pro athlete? I said, no, semi-pro, no. How old are you? Oh, you're in your forties. Here's a prescription. Go get a brace. Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't even scope my knee. They wouldn't even do anything for me. Here's a brace. Deal with it. Well, so. it's also because it's Canada. So they will try to yeah. avoid surgery at all costs because it costs them money. And uh, there's so many people in need surgery. So it's a very frustrating thing, like uh, being a Canadian and eating healthcare because, yeah, I, I, I can't stand um, my daughter. I mean, if I had the money, I could go outside of the system to a privatized, you know, to, to a private place and have it done. But, you know, I don't have, you know, $10,000 or whatever it is for the surgery. Yeah, exactly. Like we could just go to the States. It's like, um, I think New York, uh, is only 45, no, like an hour away. I'm pretty sure maybe in 45 minutes, like to go to, uh, like the border and, uh, yeah, we could get surgery there, but yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money yeah. for sure. But, uh, one thing I wanted to, uh, bring up, which is someone mentioned it on the Reddit thread. Um, cause I don't know the rules. So maybe, you know, Joey, like to promote someone to black belt, um, it's always been, two two degrees that you need and then they they kind of changed it to three um i don't really understand because i think that is still two but not really but it's kind of three so what is it well the one guy said it's five years now instead of two years is that true joe 
Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with like five or two years. It's definitely the number of degrees you have. The last I had checked, you have to be two degrees higher to promote someone. So to promote someone to a black belt, I need to be two degrees above that. So I have to be a second degree black belt. They may have changed that. Uh, that's not like something that I'm particularly like, I, I simply couldn't care less about, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, I do believe it's two degrees higher. So to get your first degree, the person giving it to you would have to be a third. Mm. That makes sense for sure. But like, yeah, I think there's more to it. Uh, I th think so. Like uh, Mike was saying something like, um, I don't know, you can only, you have to be three degrees unless there are brown belt already registered with IBJF or something. I don't know. It was, it was in the thread. I'd have to... Uh, I, they might be referring to the time it takes to like finish your registration as a black belt. So I wasn't registered with the IBJJF as a black, uh, brown belt. Um, I just didn't do it. We don't have a lot of IBJJF events in Canada, unfortunately. So there was really no purpose in me giving them a bunch of money every year to get literally nothing. So when I registered as a black belt, um, because I wasn't registered as a brown belt and compete their, complete their minimum time requirement, I'm a provisional black belt for two years, which means I can't promote anyone. I can't list myself on an IBJJF gym as a head coach. Um, there's a couple other stipulations in that for two years. And after two years, now I'm officially an IBJJF, like non-provisional black belt. I can register my gym with the IBJJF. I can sign the paperwork for people, but there is a provisional waiting period. Okay. There. Yeah. Maybe I should get on that because yeah, that'd be helpful to have everything like that and not be provisional. But I just don't want to give IBJ, IBJJF any money because they don't deserve it. They just like milk and the people and they, they're not good for the sport. But um, yeah. Yeah, here it says um, in 2017, they changed the requirements from second degree to third, which is five extra years. The one exception is it remained second degree to sign off on brown belts who are already registered at brown belt. Okay, yeah. yeah. So they just made it a little harder for people who didn't register at Brown Belt. And if you were registered at Brown Belt, it doesn't change okay. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's been almost an hour. And uh, Joey's audio sounds weird to me and Mike. So we're hoping that uh, it doesn't sound bad for the actual recording itself. So, yeah, let's hope for the best. Hopefully it, it works out. And uh, we'll get it sorted out for next time, though. But, yeah, thank you guys for uh, sticking around till the end of the end of the podcast if you're still here please leave a comment or a fist bump and we'll see you guys next time